Audiencia y bienvenidos hoy Cinema Club. I'm your host, Jason Eccles, and I'm joined by our distinguished guest and co-host, uh, Don Dino Spazzini, Steve Dez, Michaela Booth, Naomi Guerrera, and we're joined by Elizabeth Marie Velez de Jesus. Well, today, we are reviewing the 1972 court classic midnight film, The Harder They Come. Now, this is an interesting movie. Uh, I learned about this movie years and years ago when I saw this documentary called Midnight Films on the IFC channel. And uh, I was like, I don't think I had seen any of the movies on that list except for uh, Night of the Living Dead. And I just kind of always stored this one like in my back brain catalog. And uh, I was like, let me pull this out. We're doing 70s movies. And I kind of thought we were going to do... I figured that everybody was going to like go the classic route and pick movies like maybe The Godfather and you know you know that kind of stuff. And then Michaela threw a, a, a wrench into the Matrix, and she picked uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, <laughs> and that lit a fire underneath my butt. And I was like, you know what? I gotta go weird too, man, because uh, why not? So I went into a movie that I figured no one else had seen. And uh, it, it's a movie that takes place. It's an island movie. It takes. It's it's another island movie. This is like our second island movie, maybe. Third. Is it our third island movie? Guava mm -hmm. Island. We, we saw Guava Island, and uh, no. Black Mirrors. Oh, Black Mirror. Well, that was Brazil. That's I true. Tropical vibes, you mean? Tropical. But we've had some tropical vibes. We've had some movies from uh, Paraguay. We've had some movies from. Um, um, but yeah, so this is another one that we added from, uh, from, from, what did you say, Belize, but Br Brazil? Japan. Korea. Japan. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Oh, Japan counts as the island movie, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I want to just jump right into this thing, man. And I want to go straight into first impressions. I got some myself. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, start off with Steve Dez, and uh, let's see, let's Steve, see what Steve, 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 Steve thought Steve, of the film. Steve. Okie dokie. Uh, first impressions. This movie, uh, the first maybe ten to fifteen minutes, I was lost because I was like, "Wait a minute, I don't speak patois, and mm. I don't know what the heck is going on." So let me turn on the captions. And I'm glad I did, because if not, I would have been even more lost in this movie, because they were speaking English, but that English was like a Puerto Rican high-speed version of English, that they were like <laughs> eating the last of the words or like running it together, so you don't even know what the heck they're saying. Uh, so definitely watch it with subtitles. Uh, the movie uh, takes some very unique directions, uh, you think it's going to head one way, or maybe because we previously seen Guava Island, so we seen kind of like, you can say the pretty version of this. Uh, mm -hmm. th this was like the gritty version. Of, this is the gritty version of Guava Island. Yeah, it's like, this is how it really goes down. Like, this is not <laughs> a fairy tale. This is not a mystical island. This is real down to the boogie Jamaica day to day. And by, for the authenticity of it, I applaud the movie. So those are my first impressions. Sure. Anybody want to jump in after that? Feel free. I don't know how I quite like the film. Like, I can see why it's a cult classic, you know, because, like, they made a lot of really brave choices. Mm -hmm. It'd be really interesting to see... How like I, I can't remember when are like the certain dates of certain other movies like especially like anti hero movies mm. like Taxi Driver and Midnight Cowboy like it definitely had that that kind of vibe if that makes sense yeah. I I don't know if anyone else kind of felt that but like it was kind of interesting to see someone so willing to just go full force with like those themes especially since it was seventy two seventy two I thought it was a lot later. <laughs> So it does feel very exper like experimental. Like they, it was yes. like a first try, or they were trying things for the first time. I like well, that. I, mean, I agree with you. Yeah, like there's like a lot of like <laughs> beginner choices and edits in there. That's kind of rough, and it's I mean, interesting because I like mean, the main character 
produced even on it. The, even on the acting too, it was like some very beginner choices in certain characters. <laughs> yes, um, but like you know, I, this guy made his own movie, pretty much because he produced it. He did a lot of the music in it. He was the main character. Um, I don't think he wrote the script. No, I think the director. Up. I think maybe the director wrote the script. Yeah, but like he was really involved in the rest of the filmmaking, which was also something that kind of surprised me. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting film. I can't say whether or not I liked it, but I'm glad that I watched it. If that makes sense. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Um, how about you, uh, Naomi? I appreciate this film. Um. I like the color, visually was great. Editing, it was 72, I get it. Um, <laughs> it, it was me. I, the thing is, I was I was multitasking, so I was like double screening on it, and I was pretty much just being productive while watching it. So I was only able to see certain parts, and the certain parts that caught my eye were the visual parts. So there was good cinematography here, like, the visuals were great. So it's, it was something I would want to watch to get caught up in the story because I was only halfway listening. So it, it requires a double watch, you guys. Just playing it out. Right on. I loved the movie. I really enjoyed it. First time watching it. I was telling him, uh, we just watched it a few hours ago. I was getting like huge Scarface vibes. Uh, mm -hmm. I was getting City of God vibes. Yeah. Uh, just so many different films that have come since then, right? That's the, the part of it is like, oh, wow, this, is, this came out in 72, and it's from Jamaica. And, like, what else do you want? Like, you don't see these kind of movies coming from, mm -hmm. you know, a certain part. So it's similar to, like, City of God, that it's very specific to to uh, a Brazil. culture, uh, 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 you know, uh, a hood, if you will, of where the, these people come, that they have some sort of representation. Um, and in the documentary that we saw, uh, we saw a clip of, they talk about it, and this was the first Jamaican film with, like, actual Jamaican actors and, mm -hmm. you know, filmed by Jamaicans and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's huge, right? And they even talked about just, like, when it was shown in Jamaica, people just started yelling because, like, from the get go, from where they saw the bus at the beginning, because it was just like, oh my God, that's us. Like, representation matters, right? That's what has been kind of the anthem for, especially the past, I feel like, year. Um, and so to, to be able to see this film that I guess meant so much to so many people in Jamaica, like, I, I could relate with the other movies that I've seen that deal with certain you know aspects from it but i just hey he might not be the most likable character i kept going back and forth i was even telling jason of, of the you know the main character but i was in it i was in it i love the music i was just jiving you know like and and then even even when i was walking uh, frida after the movie this cop comes in an unmarked vehicle that has his cop side, and I'm just like waving at him, like they're waving at the cop <laughs> on the motorcycle. And I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want nothing to do with you, cop. <laughs> so, anyway, I just, I enjoy, I enjoy it's such a great experience. I, I thought it um, kind of like I think uh, Naomi said uh, she appreciates it. Yeah, there's so many different ways of like this hits so many different uh you know, buttons, Dino buttons, just good buttons. So I'm, I'm going to fill in for JP. I got JP's thoughts right here. Okay. Uh, he says the movie sucked and that's it. It doesn't say anything else. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it says, it says the movie, it says the movie is a strange mix of somewhat hectic editing, questionable sound mixing, storytelling and great music. <laughs> the, the film finally found its true identity in the third act when the protagonist, Ivan, becomes a violent madman driven by his ego to prove his invincibility and being worthy of the spotlight of the world in the world. Just goes to show all we really needed was to give our main character a gun to get the story going. Wow. 
Um, All right. Okay. Those are thoughts. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth, is this, uh, 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 give us your first, first impression? Yeah. My first, first impression. Okay. Well, I, well, I was, came to me, I was kind of like not fully, fully paying attention to the movie because I was about to fall asleep because work. But from what I did manage to watch, um, I really did like the cinematography, like the colors, the how authentic it was to the 70s with the attire from head to toe, everybody. Um, I do agree that it was kind of weird and strange, especially with some like sounds, like certain sounds were kind of like, I don't know, like, you know how when you watch Asian movies and they're dubbed, mm -hmm. they speak first and then the sound comes after. There was a lot of that yep. involved and in going around in the movie, which didn't make sense to me for some reason. And, but I did like, kind of like where it was heading. Like I was, even though it was in the 70s, I still think it was really relative of like what's going on in the world now and like yeah. in certain communities like you know poverty drugs this that whatever it was like whatever it is yeah i still feel like it had relevance even though it's so old it still had relevance today yeah yeah absolutely. And that's basically my first thought <laughs> Uh, I want to I want to add to the first thought as well is that I had an issue with the title of this film. Mm. I personally think a more appropriate title would have been "The Harder They Fall" instead of "The Harder They Come," because when I actually mentioned this film to a few people, they actually thought I was talking about a porn. I knew it was coming. <laughs> So I, I did think the title was maybe the fa the harder they fall, but that's again because we have that in our mind. That's the same. Me too. I, but, I accidentally yeah. called it the harder they fall multiple times. Yeah. Um. But. Well, uh, my first impression of the film was, um, <laughs> I thought it was very. Um, thought it was very rough and very primal filmmaking you know you can tell that this thing was made inexpensively but still with a lot of care for 1972 you know and i would imagine there wasn't a ton of resources these are just guests um but the, the sound was a little weird if we're just talking technical stuff uh the sound mm -hmm. was a little weird uh the editing was definitely choppy i would imagine they just edited that film like straight up with scissors you know uh, because the timing is off a lot with the edits. And, you know, mm -hmm. if they were doing it with a computer, that would be easily fixable stuff. But, you know, I'm sure they were looking at film up to a light to get this thing right. You know it what I mean? It was 16 millimeter. It was 16 so. millimeters. So that's absolutely mm -hmm. how they were editing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so super, super raw. Uh, the colors were a little muted, muted in the uh, version that we watched. So we didn't get a lot of that. We went back and watched a little bit of the footage from the the remastered one and the, the colors were like brilliant and pretty but yeah ours were a little faded because i think we were watching it from the original film stock probably um i really like the movie though because like elizabeth says it tells an age-old tale you know poverty um poverty begets violence you know to mm -hmm. a point where you know you have a young man who's coming from nothing he's coming from the rural area to the big city to like make something out of himself and he's trying mm -hmm. really hard and even though he's like still poor, the first thing he does is gets himself real fly. You know, all of a sudden he's got like snazzy clothes and like nothing else. Um, you know, he's just trying to make something. And he's like, well, you know, I got some clothes and now I'm going to get some train. I'm going to get some wheels I'm gonna and then I'm going to get a lady and then I'm going to get us a place and then I'm going to get us some money to get us out of here. And then I'm going to get a career and then we're going to blast off, baby, you know, and then the movie takes a hard turn where it's like dreams deferred. The problem that I had with the movie, I felt like the, my first impression is, is that I felt like the dream was deferred and he just smack went into like, like, like forget it. I'm not playing any more games with society. And if you get in my way, I'm blowing you away because I'm about to get it. That was like a, a hard turn because I didn't really see the anger 
from when he got uh, fleeced on that record contract. You know what I mean? I know that's it was probably devastating to have like you know this thing that you pump so much love and energy into is basically stolen from you. But the turn was a little bit weak, like in the narrative. I think that was my first impression. Um, but his his clothes, some of the costumes in this thing, my God, that that collar that went to I have never seen. I know it's the 70s, it's the early 70s, but I have never seen a collar that fly. That thing was draping down to his belly button. It was so long. That thing was incredible. <laughs> like that vest and that collar, if it was Halloween, I'd wear that right now. It was incredible. Um, you can still wear it right now. I was expecting more dreads in this movie. And it, like the first 30 minutes, I'm like, where are the dreads? They're in Jamaica. And then finally, the dreadlocks show up. And the Ross dude, uh, what was his name? Pedro? Uh, Jose? No, 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 no. Pedro. Pedro. He had the coolest dreads I've ever seen in cinema on his head. They were just sticking straight up like Basquiat on steroids. Bas- yeah. <laughs> so that was my first impressions of the movie. Um, I didn't, I'm going to be honest, I didn't love the film, but I recognize why it's such an important film in cinema because it's a lot of first. I mean, mm-hmm. How many movies, even still today, where it's an all Jamaican cast filmed down in Jamaica that gets to America? You know what I mean? I don't know if I can name one off the top of my head. You know, so it's an important movie in that regard. Um, let's go straight into characters. I want to hear what you guys thought. Like, were there some characters you guys identified with or that you uh, liked the most? Um, freely jump in however you guys want. I don't, I think that's like kind of the weird part about this film is like you can really tell when the writers kind of painted themselves in a corner because they just like randomly dropped someone new, mm-hmm. you know, but like, I think that they had such fun with casting. Like, I think they, they did such a good job trying to like fill their spaces with like people who are so authentic to what this world was. So mm-hmm. that's yeah. how I feel about the characters. The film was written by Perry uh, Hensel, who also directed it. And mm-hmm. you guys may not know this, but he's a white guy. He's a white Jamaican guy. Hmm. Interesting. I thought, yeah, I thought that was a little peculiar, but also kind of cool. Um, anybody else uh, have takes on characters? Um, I don't know. I, I felt like the movie itself was a character. Mm. I just yeah. didn't, you know, like... Like I was telling you, I was I was having troubles with really rooting for Ivan. Yep. Like all the like he just kept coming and going as someone that I wanted to root for. Yeah. Um, but based loosely on an actual person, an actual I get kind. Of, I was even saying that I was getting some Bonnie and Clyde kind of thing. Yeah, so, major Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie. Yeah, it, it's Ivan Ho, whatever the last name is, was a actual uh bandit from jamaica from oh. like the 40s and 50s so it's mm. loosely based on on that actual person um i think certain characters had moments i really like mm. uh yeah each each one kind of had like little spurts that i like just because you see the shit that they all deal in right you yeah. see the the corruption, if you will, you you see the sleaziness of everyone. Yeah. You had also mentioned about him okay. getting angry. It's like he had been yeah. shitty yeah. At since he got into the city. You know, yeah. from the get go, from the the guy that was supposed to that he paid fifty cents to push mm-hmm. his push the cart. My favorite character, by the way, the, the guy who sold his fifty cents and all his luggage when he first gets to town. That's my favorite character. That guy. <laughs> Um, I was disappointed because I was expecting a bookend. I like yeah. I wanted that guy to come back at the end, and like I wanted him to get his just dessert. Like you can't have a character like steal somebody's everything as soon as they. And he stole his mama's mangoes. Like what? Yeah. He stole everything, and he never got his just dessert in the movie. Like I wanted him to like get shot at the end or something. You know what I mean? Or or have his stuff stolen by Ivan? I don't know. I, I wanted it to come back around, but uh, yeah. I, um... so, that for, oh sorry no you go oh the 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 character guy the first one the first one that came out who jipped him off i think that's um every tourist's worst nightmare 
um, traveling and just like getting told sweetly, oh, this is gonna happen. I mean, like, well, let me help you out or whatever, or however the situation went, because I kind of dozed off. But once I saw that foot taking off, I'm like, no, that's every tourist's first dream. Don't fucking trust anybody you meet at the fucking portal. <laughs> so at the portal. Like, this dude didn't get that message or no le dijeron or le avisaron. So yeah, I, I was really heartfelt when the mangoes were taken out. I'm like, it's, it's, you know, that whole scene, I was like, oh man, I, it was really heartfelt. And it was disappointing that he didn't come out at the end. Um, I was really hoping that he would get his revenge towards that. So yeah, I agree with you, um, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I was a little heartbroken about those mangoes, man. I know it's weird, but it's like his mom said, oh, uh, what about the mangoes? Oh, sorry, mom, it was a poor harvest. Like he was so embarrassed that he got to town and she didn't think he could make it in the big city. And, and the first thing that happens to him, he loses his mom's mangoes. You know what I mean? And he, like, he's too yeah. embarrassed to even tell her. Like, I was like, oh, man, that's like heartbreaking. And they're poor and they, they, they lost the, the mom's house. They sold the house and they had to spend it on a funeral. And it's like, this is a bummer, you know? And oh, my God. oh, hard adversity in the beginning. That's, that's a lot to take in. Yeah, for sure. Um, anybody else? Cool. Um, Let's see. What else do I want to talk about in this movie? Because there's there's a lot of weird stuff that I want to cover. Like um, like uh, this might be the first movie ever that's not a western where the guy is toting two guns like straight up uh, a Chow Young Fat style, and he's just blasting dudes like hard boiled. Yeah, like well, almost never ending bullets. I'm glad they reloaded the bullets a few times in this thing, but. Like, this dude was, like, taking out guys with machine guns and Uzis with, like, two handguns from a distance. <laughs> it was, like, ridiculous. No, he wasn't hitting people. He, he barely hit anyone. He killed every... He killed he the first three kill guys. Anyone. He killed the first three. He was like, he killed three men. He killed three men. He was knocking dudes Although, out. they also watch a Western in the movie at the very beginning. Yeah, I'm um, curious what that was. It was, it was J- Django I mean, gets the they, they were like those gray things in the Power Rangers that you just push them in the middle and they disappear. Yeah. Oh, the, the guy with <laughs> the red mask on? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I figured that would be a, a foreshadowing mechanism in the movie. For sure. And, and it was. Mm-hmm. I think the that's like fire. the metaphor they realized was like what they wanted the crux of the movie to be. But they like yeah. didn't know how to get to that point. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean they got there. It was a rough ride there, though. They for did. Sure. They did. Like yeah. like I said, like they're like the the last half of the movie like speeds up really quick. Like I wonder what it would have been like if they just kind of instead of focusing so much on like the the pre like I think they just got caught up in what this guy's life was, mm-hmm. and they were trying to be as accurate as they could because mm-hmm. like. I wonder what would have happened if we got quick, like instead of starting all that craziness in the third act, if they started it in the second act. Yeah. I think it would have been an interesting play on it. And I think we would have gotten more out of Ivan's duplicity. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, yeah. I thought he was also just uh, uh, gone from his girl, right? right. From an Eliza or Eliza, whatever it was. Didn't like that surprised me. Her spoiler, right? Her at the very end, because I was like, I thought she wasn't in the picture anymore, and then it was just like, I'm, I'm setting him up. Their, their relationship kind of like fizzled pretty fast. Like they had like this whirlwind runoff, get, get it low type situation together, and then like the next scene, they're like. Kind of like in a, a loveless marriage all of a sudden. He's just into himself. Yeah. And she's like, you know, where are you going? What are you doing, sir? And, you know, that, that was that was fast transition. I get it. I know what they were trying to say and do. And they did it. But it's like, I need to see something, you know? And mm-hmm. sometimes there was cuts in the movie that flash forward so fast. I'm like, oh, how far in the future are we right now? Like, what just happened? Yeah. So that was yeah. a little confusing. Uh, what you guys think of the music? I personally thought the music was amazing. I enjoyed it. I liked it. It gave it more of a vivacious tone to the movie. It reminded me of Guava Island, but in a way, Guava Island reminds you of this because it's older. Uh, what I liked really more than anything about the film 
is like I said before, is the authenticity. Because for example, when they were showing like the church scenes, like I felt like I was at church. Like I felt I was there with them and everything. And that's Same. something that a lot of films these days cannot even bring you to the actual world. And I felt with this movie like I was there. I agree, man. I, I love the music in this thing. Like I caught myself humming along and singing it before the film was even done. You know, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to go uh, find the soundtrack and put it on my playlist. But you must try. <laughs> I love beats. But you must try. <laughs> I always lose my rhythm. Um, I really enjoyed the music. Um, I read briefly that this movie was actually an introduction to the reggae vibe and whole scene in the U.S. So because of this movie, we know reggae of what it is because of la, la movie, película. Um, you talked about the church scene. I felt the same way in regards to um, how they captured it. So they put like a dark silhouette and a backlight. That is like made it look like they were doing something devious or they weren't supposed to do. So I feel like they captured that moment very well. Like, no tenemos que hacer esto, hay que hacerlo mirar así. And they executed that perfectly because we all felt the night vibe, you know what I mean? So I like that whole great black silhouette, red backlight. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you on the church scene. It's, uh, it's pretty intimate, isn't it? You do, you feel like you're in church watching this thing. It's like, it just... Very similar to Black Orpheus, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, what was with the, the, the women had the little uh, graduate hats on? Anyone know what that's about? Couldn't figure it Ooh. out. Graduate? You in bonnets? They had like the little graduation caps with the tassels on yeah. it. Only the women had it on in the choir. Oh, I guess it's just like part of part of a, the choir attire or the uniform. Yeah. Uh, did you I, just pull that out of your ass or did you look No, it because I actually grew up in Mormon community and grandma oh, sang okay. church choir and it was a tire, okay. you know, like a uniform. You said Mormon place. community? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what a cross contradiction in my home. <laughs> no, you know, no. I mean, it's amazing to find that out right she now. She was trying to like... Sneak it through, like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, man. Um, what were we were talking about the, the church scene. Oh, and the music. Uh, so, yeah, that's a, a really interesting thing because in the documentary, they credit this movie with breaking the reggae scene in America. This movie played for six years at the Orson Welles Theater in New York as a midnight movie. Six years nonstop. And I guess a part of the rule there is that you have to sell out those shows because it was a, a really big deal to have that midnight spot in Manhattan. Like, you know, tons of movies wanted to be there. And they said for like week after week after week, this thing was filling up the 400 seat theater for six years. The thing, it just wouldn't go away. 400 seats? What you yeah. say? I said 400 seats. I'm impressed. Like yeah. for the 400 seats, like every every weekend. Like night. we said, pre Twitter. Yeah, pre Twitter. And in the the ad they put in the newspaper was like very very tiny. It wasn't a picture well, or anything. Because at first they tried to release this and they did it trying to do it like black exploitation. Yeah, and it didn't work. Like that, the uh, poster that. Yeah, yeah the poster that you see is what they did for america cinema and so like it just didn't sell because it's not that at all it's not son of shaft or whatever yeah you know but they they clearly were trying to sell it off that way but yeah it, this predated uh bob marley they even in the documentary they talked about it that um it, you know bob marley and the whalers came to manhattan to play kind of on the strength of this movie because people were like we need more reggae music where can we get this reggae stuff and bob marley just kind of showed up on the scene like i got it for you baby and uh mm -hmm. so yeah it helped break it helped break broke them when they came to new york to perform for the first time so that's pretty crazy that's incredible yeah welcome back elizabeth hi um, we were just talking about the music in this movie and we wanted to know how much you loved it or hated it 
Um, the music. Um, well, I actually I liked it because, I mean, I think it was weird. I mean, I'm not gonna lie; it was very peculiar. It's it's obviously not common. It's not popular for sure. But I can't 100% say, say I hated it because I like kind of like that type of cult music, which is kind of very unusual, ordinary, like sound, very like a typical type of sound. So yeah, I can't say I totally hated it for sure. I think we all actually loved it. I was just testing you. Um, <laughs> so the music was composed by Jimmy Cliff, the guy who was in the movie. It was those were his songs. Him and another guy wrote them. So that's you know pretty dope. So um, he was basically like Ice Cube from Jamaica. Basically, he like yeah. sang and then performed. Damn. Yep. He was the, the. That's exactly right. He was the Ice Cube of Jamaica. Damn. That's dope. <laughs> Still pretty weird sound for me. I can't say I liked it, but I can't say I hated it totally. Yeah. Well, we were saying that it broke the the reggae. Uh, it broke reggae music in America. Like most people had never even heard reggae. Like really, when this uh, movie came out, and people mm -hmm. couldn't get enough of it. And then Bob Marley showed up, and they were like, "Whoa!" You know. Of but course. Bob Marley came and toured. Uh, in New York off the strength of this movie. Wow. Um, Amazing. Uh, let's talk about those costumes, you guys. These are 1970 costumes. There's <laughs> definitely island vibes all over them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, I guess, island colors. We noticed a lot of yellows, yes. which I didn't really care for so much. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm go ahead and start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I wanna. I, I just wanna uh, give a shout out uh, to the main dude. What was his name? Uh, uh, Ivan. Uh, Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe. Ivan. Because uh, this dude uh, signed the worst contract in history. Uh, got a twenty dollar deal, uh, and this dude was dressed like Bad Bunny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, he was like every rapper out there that signs a deal and goes like, yo, I'm dressed the part. You know, I'm going to make a big. Next thing you know, we're going to be in Europe. You know what I'm saying? And uh, man, what a, what, a, what a leap of faith uh, this guy took in this movie. Uh, but yeah, but that was that was by far the dress that I liked the most is when he had like that whole yellow thing get up going yeah. on. What what did I say also? The other vibes I was getting from his character at a certain time. I was like, he's got I'm getting huge Steve Des vibes. Oh, he did say that. <laughs> he said this guy's giving me Steve Des vibes, for sure. <laughs> he had the glasses on and all that. And I was just like, Oh my god, I know where Steve Des came from now. Uh, but you know, he he tried to hustle, but I mean a small island like that. There is one producer, and everyone's like, we can't cross the producer. And then once you get into the drug business, it's like, it all goes up through Jose. And it's like, don't want to cross Jose. And Jose goes up through the police. And the police, you know, so it was like, he tried everything, man. And then it's great. I don't know. Were people going to talk about music? I really enjoyed the movie. It's, it's very, you know, it's not perfect. But then it's like what he was fighting for then they were basically like, hey, we're giving all the drug handlers a raise. And he's like, that's what I was trying to get. Yeah. That's what I was working for. Because he, he was smart. He saw the numbers. He saw the plane that got captured in, in the U.S. and how much money that was. And he's just computing a la Steve Dez and also Jason that can do quick gymnastic math in their heads. And it's like, wait a second, I'm getting $15 or I have to pay $15 and then they pay and they goes and it goes and they get 100000 blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it's basically a, a Steve Dez. Well, that was my favorite thing about the character, like how entrepreneurial he was. And he just, he questioned everything. Yeah. And I was really surprised 
that he didn't take that contract right off the rip. I thought he was going to take it, and then he was just going to be some stupid farm boy with a messed up record deal, and the thing was going to blow up. But it took a twist. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, great. He asked for more money, so much so that everybody laughed at him. Like, you, there's no way you're getting 10 times what you just asked for. And even then, it wouldn't have been enough if you really think about it. You know, but and then he, you know, had to settle for, you know, the little bitty money because he still had a bigger vision. Like, well, I, I still believe in the song. I believe in the song so much. I'll take your measly 20 bucks because people are going to love it. And my name's going to get out there. But then the man. Yeah, he was like, don't play it. Just play it enough to get my money back. But I don't want to make him a star until he becomes uh an icon and then it's like gotta keep playing it and i there were that's what i enjoyed of it there were just a lot of bureaucracy and yeah. a lot of corruption just corruption throughout really mm -hmm. real uh indicative of just the world <clears throat> what was it don't you ask if you ask questions you don't have to lie what was it? uh ask no questions tell no lies yeah that was that was his friend's quote. Yeah. Jose? Was that? No. No, I think Pedro. that was Pedro. 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 That was Pedro. Yeah, Pedro was the friend. Jose was the boss guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was, that was, uh, that's a good quote, I thought. I got to look that up and find out where that came from. Is that, maybe it's that Shakespeare? What is that? I had one of your favorite Bible verses also, huh? Yeah, the preacher's first thing. And okay, and the preacher. What about <laughs> the preacher? Like, what about the mom? The mom never showed up again. No, the mom never showed up again. At least in Scarface, she comes back towards the end, you know? And yeah. Makes one final appearance. The, the, the preacher is corrupt, and we find out that this dude's just grooming that young lady the whole time. Like, he's super foul. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of weirdness in this movie. I can see how this guy just figures, like, this whole freaking island is corrupt, and I'm just going to have a, I'm just going to break bad. I get it. <clears throat> you guys better start interjecting, man. The attire, <laughs> I wish I had more time or the spare time to have seen more of the attire. I probably would re watch this just to reference the attire. I, 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 that, that was a missed opportunity for me right there. Oh, you didn't, oh, yeah, you didn't watch it hard enough to notice the. No, I was just like, like auditory listening and just like capturing certain things. I'm like, whoa, that's dope, you know. That was just me. Well, yeah. just, I wonder how much of the costuming was actually done by a costumer or how much of this was actually like people's actual clothes in their closet. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. since I since Jimmy did so much, like I fully believe that that was like, no, this is like my sets. Like this is what I wear when I sing in the club. Yeah, like, so this is yeah. what he wears. He's you an know? actual legit musician still performing. He is. Oh, wow. he is. In 2012, he was still performing. That's great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this, this, some of these clothes were wild, and yeah, he's I, still I, performing with the same outfits, also. From... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the most Jamaican thing in it was the, the the bell boy. The bell boy had on that traditional Ooh. Jamaican all white thing yeah. with the safari kind of hat. That's the one that stood out to me. I'm like, whoa, that's super authentic. That's Jamaican right there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Um, and then what about the two cars? They had two like cocaine white cars. A Mercedes. That old diesel convertible Mercedes, which was, I would drive that thing today. I would drive both of those cars today, honestly. <laughs> they were both pretty sick. I mean, those are classics for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were, those were you know, cars. And, and, and that's how you showed wealth, you know? That's probably yeah. what, you know? And what happened to the car he stole? What do you what do you suppose happened to it? Because he took it to a golf course. Yeah. And did he? What, did he leave it there? Why he probably not? just left it there. He probably like, don't know. Where would he take it? Where would he take it that would hide? Gas. Yeah, he probably yeah. drove it until the gas right now. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with it now. Yeah, it is fun. Like, and I, I think that was like what was so interesting about his little crime spree is like so much of it was him just doing whatever the heck he wanted because like. You know, that's that's how he'd had to get what he wanted at the end. And just to just to interject on something Jason said earlier about the preacher. That didn't shock me because it, when you go back to that scene at church, it also feels very sexually charged, that scene. Like when, so? you have, 
when they have like the women like passing out and doing all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I think it was intentionally also because I think they were playing weren't they playing flashbacks also or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, not or flash forward maybe. And that's what I wasn't oh, sure if if that was actual uh her like um fantasizing or if it was actually what we ended up seeing later right i, I was, think just the way it was filmed it was so close on her eyes i think i feel like yeah you're right it was very sexual because I, I think those were fantasies right that's what i, I think I so too because like they added this extra sparkle to it yes too. I, was, I had the sparkles like, the 70s like sparkles. they put sparkles in there <laughs> Yeah. That was usually for like disco uh, song. And in the scene before, she like you know they're inquiring. She kind of you know gaze back at him like, "Hello, soldier." You know, mm-hmm. oh, I see you yeah, back there. I, I think the breaking point was the fact that he spent six dollars on on tires for that bicycle. I think that's all we had to know. Oh, it was definitely he, he. He almost no. killed a man over that. So, like, mm-hmm. I, but yeah. Did you I see the ketchup slices? Oh my god! I was like, <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I'm like, I love this. I love straight that. up ketchup. Yes, it was so beautiful. <laughs> also, also, do, also, do Jamaican dollars have like no value in this movie? Because we never even heard the exchange rate or nothing. It was just about the dollars. I don't feel like we saw any money in this movie. Did we see any money? Yeah, when she, he hands it to his mom, and then oh right, but I mean you don't see the you know checking or anything, but yeah, yeah I mean they talk about it a lot, yeah. so and I I think it's that's what you kind of need because like or I I don't know. Oh, and he even when he gets paid by the producer, he gets the twenty. Oh, and then that's he, right. You're he right. Takes out Wad and pays everyone else as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, th- this movie had so many different ways. It could it could have just been like a musician being suckered for everything, or like there were so many sections that you could have seen this movie uh, kind of end up. Let yeah. me ask you guys a question based on something that uh, Michaela just said. Um, do you think his descent into criminality was justified? Do you think like the story justified him going down into a rabbit hole like that? So I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I personally think that it's literally like, I mean, every action he was trying to do from the get go, again, it's not completely justified in the film itself, mm-hmm. but just based on the character standpoint, he was trying to do everything, literally everything he could imagine, figure out, do what's available around him to get the fuck out. Like basically like have a better life somewhere else or leave the island in some type of capacity mm-hmm. to the point that is like when you are literally dr- drowned of options, you don't see another escape. Like it's not like he can have hoop dreams in this mm-hmm. movie. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like, is it their music or drugs or I'm I'm an outlaw, <laughs> basically. GTA mode, all stars. And I think that's what happened. It's just like he was just like, yo, my only way out out of here really is by me dying. And like at this point, I'm just like gonna risk it all. Cause uh cause, That's yeah. a really good take, man. Yeah, no, That's I kind of agree with Des, except for one thing. It's just they, they make a point to establish that he does have a cruel streak. You know, like, I definitely think that, like, him being cornered is a huge part of it. But I feel like if he would have been a kinder character, they would have had to, like, have him manipulate things differently. Like, he'd be on the run, but it wouldn't necessarily have been his fault. Whereas here, like... It's because he escalated every single time, you know, like he was so desperate to get the jump that he was willing to like go cross that line times 10, you know? Well, after he got whipped I, in the ass, you know, well, that like hard, it, he was like, you know like, what? Like, I am not going to do What did he get whipped this. for? Well, you know, like he, the guy just didn't give him his bike. He almost, he maimed that man. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think well, he deserved that. Like he won, he won the fight. He didn't have to do all that to his face. It's a good point. He won the fight. It's a good point. I feel I feel that when you get to that like desperateness of like trying to get out or trying to get to your dream or do whatever you have to do physically, you don't know what's right or wrong. Everything is free for all. So mm. at this point, this person in his mind is probably everything is the same. Whatever I do, whatever I try, whatever action I take is going to be equal because it's going to towards this goal. And I don't but care like they, what it takes. I'm just going to do it. It's That's just how they make I feel that he did. I, 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 like, and I agree to you like for an extent. Like That's such a huge part of his motivation. It's just they make the point to show that he relishes in abusing power. That's the thing, because that's what that scene was. Because, like I said, he won the fight. He got the stab in. The guy was on the ground. He could have taken the bike and left. You know, I don't, I don't he think chose it to stay so and cut up his face. He chose to do that. I think you know, that whereas if he was just like, way. okay, I taught you your lesson. You know, don't mess with me anymore. Like that's he could have left it at that. And then when we say we get punished, then we could have known that like that was all stacked against him it's just that one part where he just takes it a little too far, too far. and that's what i think is interesting is like he, he always takes it to the nth extreme by the like, way he, when, he, when he cut up his face was he attacked by the killer tomatoes or what <laughs> <laughs> it was a crossover for sure there you go <laughs> you know but i think I also- interesting oh go ahead Oh, sorry. But I also feel like if you sometimes, I mean, obviously, it's not right, but when you're surrounded by all that violence and drug and this and that, you're like constantly living in that. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you don't know how to break from that habit. So probably, yes, he did take it too far. But again, it's so ingrained in his brain, it just automatically. So probably he didn't even think that he was doing that until after, maybe. So yeah. he probably did it just automatic because it's kind of like how they grew up, how they do stuff, and it's just like like a robot. So he just automatically did that. Yeah, those okay. are both really good points, actually. Um, and you notice every time he was cornered, he would lash out in very extreme ways. Like when he had no more options, it's like he just went to the extreme, you know? And uh, one thing that I just noticed when you guys were all giving your, you know, take on, you know, how this thing sort of plays out, it feels a lot like slavery, him being on this island, you know, because it's like he's born into this weird situation where there's no uh, I mean, he got, he got he got worse than Kunta Kinte. Well, maybe. Maybe I have to go back and reference that to <laughs> to double check. But yeah, all I know is the guy in in the fla- like he had a little flashback when he was in the motorcycle and the cop. Yeah, he's like, like I'm not going I back noticed to that. the flashback. The 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 guard with the whip. Like it's not just like I whip you. He ran and like like he took a running start, and I was like, damn. Like, it wasn't just like, I'm whipping you. I'm going to run like I'm about to kick a goal, a penalty shot, but I'm just going to hit you with it. Violence. Oh, man. Violence. Maybe, maybe the other thing that he probably or thought or kind of worked around was because the only thing he can control is his actions. Everything around mm-hmm. him, he can't control. And so, Therefore, since he can't control what's surrounding him, he can only control what he does. I feel like that's probably why he also did what he did. Because since he can't, like, he's trying his best to, again, leave and do whatever. It's It's just, like, his... Yeah, it's just his form of, like, just having control over everything. Yeah, I get it. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's exactly what it was, actually. I think... You know, since I have no control, I'm just going to burn the whole thing down. I have control yeah. of that. I'm going to burn it down until they stop me. Mm-hmm. Burn. You know what's sad, too? Because he's very much the anti-hero, right? But you also sort of understand it from his perspective. It's like, well, you guys are going to let me out of here. No matter what I do, you're not going to let me, like, go upward. And he's a very talented guy, right? Like, 
you know, he got himself a job and he was able to do the, you know, the, the mechanic or whatever he was. He was like some kind of smith of some kind, yeah, you know, bicycle mechanic. bicycle mechanic or whatever. And then he becomes like, you know, he's this really talented musician and, you know, he's actually really good at like selling drugs. And, you know, so he's like he does all these things. Well, he's super ambitious. He's going to make it, yeah. but they mm-hmm. won't let him make it. They won't let him out. And it eventually leads to him like either going to jail or being beat. Because he keeps asking questions. He sees the math. He like sees like, wait, I'm doing this work and you're only giving me this much. But mm-hmm. you're taking, you know, all that. Um, I have a, a question or a comment or a, a thing I noticed. At the end, spoilers, uh, he's out of bullets. And he's still, he's like, I'm done for. But like like you guys even mentioned before, I'm not going to go to jail. Mm-hmm. So he's like, who's got the best draw? Who's got the best draw? And it was Scarface. It, well, Scarface was still got bullets. No, I mean still. like the original Scarface. Like he just, I'll just run out. <laughs> right, right. Or Butch Cassidy also, right? Yeah, of them. yeah, yeah. But this one... What the difference? The other guys had guns, yeah. so it was like I'm going and I'm gonna die in a flurry. Yeah, but is this like the first time where the person is out of bullets and still decides like you know what I'm just gonna go and and psych them out and have them killed? Because there are other movies since then of like an antihero or whatever that's like okay I'm out of out of bullets, but. I'm gonna I'm gonna go and 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 pretend I still have bullets because I'm not gonna uh, be taken. I, I don't think it's the first time. Um, there's also well, the movie. Uh, well, uh, maybe it is. It could be the first time. Yeah, it could be the first time. But it's happened many times well, since. Right. Well, I mean, I think a big part of it too is they're trying to do a <laughs> reversal of the scene that they showed us that of them all watching. You know, yes. like where you think the the hero's all out of bullets and then he pulls out the machine gun. And mows them all down. Whereas this is like a complete opposite reversal where he doesn't have that plan B, where he doesn't have that. And right. they have all of those things. Well, also keep in mind that many times throughout his chaos, he said, I'm not hiding. And they're like, well, you need to run. I'm not running. Like, well, you should hide. I'm not going to hide. So he's like, they're just going to have to take me out. You know, I'm not going anywhere. And then when they talked about Cuba, he didn't want to go to Cuba at first. He decided I'll do it when he goes, wait, I can just go there and join the revolution. I'll be a revolutionary. They'll yeah. accept me there because I'm, a, I'm, I'm about that life. So let's, I'll do that. And that was a good idea for him. I was a little sad he didn't make the boat. Were you guys sad that he didn't make the boat because he was so close? It wasn't just revolutionary. I think his mind was, I'm going to Cuba. They're going to fix me up because they're really good doctors there because uh, Che Guevara was a doctor, which... And then I think the way he meant was, I'll come back with a revolution to uh, to Jamaica. Oh, you think that was the idea? Oh, yeah. Bro, the moment this dude started trying to swim, I'm like, he's not making that boat. <laughs> because <laughs> of one arm? He was swimming like, with one arm. Yeah, it had to be a tragedy, guys. It's a tragic he was so ending. close. He missed the ladder by this much. He even mm-hmm. had it, just couldn't hang on. Just couldn't hang on. Yeah, that was sad. I, I, and I, I, I didn't guess, see that coming. Yeah. I guess that they was, didn't have a life buoy. That was, to, that was totally CGI that he swam that far. <laughs> <laughs> his life was on the line, man. His adrenaline kicked in and he made it out to the boat. It just, no, he was swimming like a three-year-old. Let's be honest. <laughs> it, was, it was bad. It was bad swimming. I'm not going to hold you up. But they edited it well enough where he's like, oh, he's, he's going to catch it. He's almost there. And yeah. <laughs> In real life, he probably wouldn't have caught it. You're right. Yeah. He could have easily have swam to Cuba. Or he would have. He timed it. That's what happened. He saw the boat coming. I'm going to time it. I'm going to swim out this far and you know meet it. I'm going to meet it head on. Yeah, poor guy. Poor guy. Poor uh, Jimmy Cliff. Poor Ivanhoe. All right. Well, I think we covered uh, the, a great deal of the movie. Let's uh, jump into final thoughts. Um, Elizabeth. Grace us with your final thought for the movie, and would you recommend it to friends? And if so, who specifically uh, would you try to recommend it to? Okay, so my final thoughts are, I'm going to rewatch it, because, again, I didn't finish the whole movie, because I fell asleep, because I needed to work. But 
from what when I stopped watching it, um, I really I was still interested in, on the movie just because it is weird and it was again it is relatable to what we're going through with like politics, corruption, drugs, violence, everything that you know sometimes we live in our day to day. So I would recommend it to myself to finish it off. Nice, excellent choice, excellent choice. Um, uh, Michaela, uh, who who would you recommend this movie to, or would you recommend it? And give us a final thought. I mean, I think that this is like 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 you said, this has a very important role in American cinema, whether we'd like to admit it or not. I really like to see. Um, what dates a lot of these other anti-hero movies of the 70s, like when they came out, because I have a feeling this kind of almost predates a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that means that this has had a huge influence on what was going on in the culture then. And um, I think this is like a really good film to watch if you're a true cinephile. And that's who I'd suggest it to. Excellent point. And just to piggyback off your final thought for a moment, uh, you said that, like, when does it come out? So this movie came out in 72, and many of those anti-hero movies came out near the end of the 70s. And most of them are by New York directors or take mm -hmm. place in New York. Taxi Driver, Godfather, um, uh, Midnight Cowboy. Like, in all those movies, and this movie played for six years in New York. I so, can see that pioneering a lot of directors into that. Or a lot of directors, pine like, this movie pioneering the directors to go that way at the end of the 70s. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Like, that's why I think that, like, it's very interesting that, like, that's what, because, like, I how I wonder how many people who, like, wrote scenes were like, oh, wait, you can do that? Yeah, yeah for <laughs> and sure. And people want to watch it? Yeah. Yeah, you know? I, I do believe, you know, whether people want to admit it or not, maybe even on a subconscious level, I don't know, but this thing definitely influenced some major films of the 70s, absolutely. I mean, yeah, cause, and yeah, now I'll, ha I'll, I'll have to go and look back at either comments or whatever, because, you know, Spielberg and Scorsese, they're usually pretty open about taking from, like, Lawrence of Arabia and Hidden Fortress or Kurosawa. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to kind of take a look back and see who, if anyone mentions this film as one of the things that they saw. Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, Naomi, how about you? Uh, final thought? Uh, and would you recommend this to anyone? I recommend the, this movie to those who like music and want to explore a interesting side of a culture. Mm. Um, this movie actually staples the Jamaican culture in a beautiful way, story-wise, ouch, but like, <laughs> the, character, the character of the whole, like, Jamaica period is beautifully shown here, and I really like that. It's very cultural um, based there. Um, color is phenomenal. There's a lot of organic shots here, like when the bus is moving, swirling. Like, I really wa like watching that in the beginning. Um, if you want to study a 70s chop vibe, follow this. You know what I mean? That's what I recommend it too. Awesome, awesome. Bored. <laughs> Gino, how about you? Uh, I'd recommend this to uh, bicycle lovers. Mango lovers? <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah, people d definitely, uh, so many different types of people. I, I've, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It'd, it'd be tough. It's like, I think people that are into kind of cinema from like the 70s or 60s, kind of the grittier stuff, mm -hmm. definitely uh, people that are into like, trippy music even something like clockwork orange i feel like there's there's stuff from that that you know is is in this with bureaucracy and and corruption and all that yeah so uh i, I would i would recommend this organically to people if i get to know them yeah um yeah i just really enjoyed it again story-wise sometimes characters not really my favorite characters but i like the essence a lot like mm -hmm. just what you're able to accomplish it's another of those stories of just like you have friends you have a camera let's go 
make magic. Yeah. So very cool. Uh, Steve, uh, final thoughts, and would you recommend this, and to who? Uh, final thoughts. This film is great. Uh, it's one of those films that definitely will fall under the radar again because of the title. I think they should have gone with the how do they fall instead of with the how do they come. <laughs> it's difficult, especially in the 21st century. You might be, people might be thinking you're talking about a Pornhub category or something. And uh, I would recommend it specifically to a lot, but I mean, uh, outrageous amount of white people. I would recommend this movie to a lot of white people that live in the suburbs that never grew with struggle or anything, just so they get the chance to get inside their heads of what other people in other situations are born without many resources go through. Because for example, I'm currently right now as we re are recording this in Medellin, Colombia, and out here I met a dude that was in prison for eight years. And this dude, when I was talking to him, is very institutionalized because he was in prison for eight years. Mm -hmm. So if a lot of white people watch a movie like this, and then at the end, they just go like, what the fuck? What happened? I'm confused. Was there flashbacks? Was there flash forwards? I don't know what happened. I'm so confused. I'm like, you see that same mental state that's what people that have to live through that go every single day. And you getting exposed to that is the best way for it. we begin to understand each other. And that's by being aware of what other people go through because the authenticity of this film goes through the roof. Not the fight scenes, they're fu funny and, and <laughs> they're very funny and, and very 70s style. But, uh, but as far as like the actual context of what people go through, the struggle that it is mm -hmm. just to leave your own country, uh, mm -hmm. it's insane. And a lot of people are not exposed to that and I recommend it to those people. And to interject for JP, because I'm today's JP's uh, representative, he said he will, recommend, <laughs> he will recommend in a group setting or movie party and to those who will be patient enough to enjoy the movie after a slow start. Hmm. Final thoughts. Wow, those are some thoughts, man. You guys, wow, you guys got me thinking. That's pretty great. Uh, <clears throat> my final thought is, is that I really enjoyed the movie. I'm glad I finally got a chance to watch it. And I'm even more pleased that I got a chance to uh, watch it and share it with a group of people and talk about it. That's, that's incredible. Like, it's so much more enjoyable to be able to speak to people about a film like this. Um, yeah, the movie has some hard moments in it. But the movie also has some hard truths in it, too, you know, and some hard things to deal with. And I love the fact, like, I wouldn't have thought to say, like, I'll, you know, give this to, like, mainstream America or mainstream white people to watch. But I think you got a really good point there, Steve. Um, I, I would have said, though, that I would I would recommend this movie to cinephiles, people who like midnight movies, to people who like cult classics, uh, Jamaicans. Uh, I would recommend it to preachers, drug dealers. Um, uh, what else? Uh, not to Tom Hanks' son. Not not to not to uh, white people born in America who think they're Jamaican. Uh, but I I um. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just don't for this. She said it's true. <laughs> It's true. Mm -hmm. I think I would like to see this movie in a theater with like in a midnight movie setting. I just like to see how people who are like stoned and eating snacks are enjoying the music watching this thing. So I don't think I will necessarily need to watch this again. Um, but I would, uh, but I would definitely watch it in a midnight movie setting again, just to see how the audience experience it together. Yeah. You know, I would like to dig that uh, vibe. Um, I, I would recommend this to people who like violent movies and movies about drug dealing and people who like movies about the underdog trying to come up, man. Um, basically the same crowd as people who, that enjoy Scarface, just a, a lot more raw, independent version of that. Right, or if people bring up City of God or films City that are God. kind of in that, that, that just like, well, you know, you should check this out. Yeah. This one came before. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and maybe people who are like, uh, a little bit more keen or even desperate to see some black cinema 
because holy smokes, this thing came out at a time like that black exploitation was just starting to pop off, and they're like, hey, we can make a movie in Jamaica, and in black exploit in, in uh, black exploitation wasn't even like on the radar when they were trying to do it. They're like, let's just make a movie about what's going on around us. So I think that's really cool. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the harder they come, you guys. Nineteen seventy-two. Um, Steve, what do you got for us next week? Next week, uh, I don't know why you asked me because it's actually JP's turn that he's not here, so we don't have a movie for next week. So yeah, that's it. No, I'm JP. kidding. <laughs> I'm completely joking. As uh, JP's legal representative for tonight, uh, <laughs> JP, I asked me to say these words. He says, the 70s has been described as the decade. Wait, 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 wait. I, I'm not hearing JP. Can you uh, restart that and give it a little bit more of a JP uh, flavor to it? Uh, the 70s have been described as the decade. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop. I think, you, I think you captured something there. The 70s have been described as the decade where the birth of the modern disaster movie took place. Here are three, but it's really four. Four icon iconic films of the past that you must choose. What element, what will your element be? Earth, water, fire, or earth. So we oh, have. You said earth twice, no? Earth, water, fire, or air? No. Air, air, <laughs> air. air. Got it. Earth, air, air. water, fire, or air. So we air. have to vote on that? Yes. So uh, we have one of four choices. So, Elizabeth, since you're brand new, I'm going to show the movies. They each have a number. You pick the one that you want, but you don't show your number until I tell you to, okay? Okay. Uh, so movie number one is... Oh, Earth you're sure? Okay. Earthquake. All right. Okay. Movie number two, The Towering Inferno. Okay. Movie number three, Airplane, Airport. I thought it was airplane, but it's airport, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and movie number four, Hell Upside Down. Oh, the Poseidon Adventure. Yeah. So yeah, it's actually the Poseidon Adventure. Not oh, Hell the Poseidon. Upside Upside. Adventure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a really bad poster, I think. Yeah. Okay. It's an awful poster. <laughs> okay. So number one, earthquake. Earth. Number two. Tower Inferno, fire. Number three, airport, uh, air. And number four, the Poseidon Adventure. Very cool, JP. Wow. So. Very creative. Very make, lazy for making us pick. <laughs> I don't know why you guys are like giving him kudos. Uh, Thank so you. Everybody got I their got pick. Everybody I got, got my pick. pick. Okay. So we'll show the number in the countdown of three. So three, two, one. The number, oh, I don't remember what number mine Water. was. I think. Water. <laughs> I, I'm going fire, whatever number that was. Was I'm, that two I'm or three? three? It's two, but you, Jason, you're, you're, you lost already. Oh. So, <laughs> Water, baby. Wait, so try between Miami, you pick four? four? Yeah. I've well, the Water winning and is... The Poseidon Adventure. That's the one that won. Uh, almost won. Airport. Uh, and only one vote from Jason from here. So I mean, You guys went against Steve McQueen and Paul Newman? What's the matter with you people? <laughs> I mean, you can still watch it on your own yeah. terms. Yeah. Uh, There's so many other better movies with them in it. I've never seen them. <laughs> there you go. So for Michaela, Steve Des TV, now YG, Elizabeth Mariveles de Jesus, long ass name, El Domino, Jason Eccles. <laughs> we'll see you Ciao. next week. Ciao. Bye bye. Hi, I'm JP Cerno, and welcome. Uh, thank Hi, I'm JP Cerno, and thank you for watching Oye Dino Let.
Hi, I'm JP Cerno, and thank you for watching Oye Demono Demon the fucking shit. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm JP Cerno, and thank you for watching Oye Demon Right? Whole Jesus time. Not even a flub. And I just. I, as soon as it's the third one, because this is the third one, right? I am JP Cerno, and thank you for watching Oye Demon Demon Demelo Oye Demelo Supercut of every time I fuck it up. Hey, I'm JP Cerno, and thank you for watching Oye Demon Network. Hey, I'm JP Cerno, and thank you for watching Oye Demon Network. And uh, click here for additional videos, and don't forget to subscribe. The lonely singles in your neighborhood already did.